and welcome to worship. Let's stand as we sing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Stand with me, please. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today to thank you for the day that you have given us. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather with my brothers and sisters in Christ. We just pray that you would bless Robbie and the choir and our musicians and technicians as they lead us, Lord, in the music part of our worship, and then prepare our hearts for what the Word of God teaches us 
and a faith response. We invoke your presence through the heart of every believer that's here today, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to just remain standing, I just want to say a word of welcome to you this morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church and hope that you've had a wonderful week. And if your week has not just been peachy keen, then look to the Lord this morning as many of us are doing and we're finding the, the sunshine of God's love even in the midst of darkness. Amen. And I hope that things are looking good for you. And if not, then hang on because God's got this. And he is good all the time. God is good. And so we welcome you here if you're in our congregation or if you're coming to us over the airways of television or radio. We are so glad that you are being a part of our worship experience this morning. I want us now at this time to turn around and welcome each other. And just take your time and do that. And if you need a hug, get a hug in an appropriate way, and just welcome everybody, okay? God bless you. We're glad you're here today. Let's look happy to be at the Lord's house.
may be seated. I'll ask our ushers to come forward. You know, one of the most worshipful times in the service is whenever we give our tithe and offering back to the Lord, recognizing everything that we have belongs to Him and that it comes from Him. And all He asks is for us to give Him the first portion in worship, acknowledging Him as Jehovah Jireh, the great provider of all that is. Let's bow our heads and give Him thanks for His blessings. Father, we come to you today and thank you for the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We know that everything we have, every breath we draw, the health that we enjoy, Lord, every dollar that we have, every place we have to live, or everything comes from you. And Lord, we just want to worship you as the provider of all that is. So, Lord, please accept now our gift, our tithe, and our offering. And, Lord, just multiply it and use it for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ here in our own community and to the ends of the earth. Father, we worship and adore you with this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Robbie, choir, musicians. Isn't it great that we've got somebody like Robbie that can step in when Larry has to be away? What a great job he does. Each year, riders and their dogs race more than 1,000 miles for several days through the Alaskan snow country from Anchorage to Nome for an event called Iditarod. It's the famous dog sled race. The genesis or beginning of Iditarod was something very serious. In 1925, hundreds of children in Nome, Alaska had been exposed to diphtheria. And at this point in history, children around the world died from the highly contagious disease because widespread vaccinations had not yet been introduced. There was a serum to it, and the only serum to combat the disease was far away in Anchorage. And to get the serum to Nome quickly, it was first carried by train as far as it could go by train. And then teams of riders known as mushers and their dogs strategically placed along the path carried the serum to Nome via a relay. So by combining a, a right medicine with a radical effort, hundreds of lives were saved. And while the Iditarod has an amazing origin, it has now just become another sporting event. The teams race a similar path, but the motivation is quite different now. They still tie sleds behind the dogs, but they are not racing to save lives anymore. The same is often true of our churches. If we are not intentional, what was once a life-saving mission can become just another Sunday event. As a church, we can gather people and we can go through the motions of Christian discipleship without a sense of the life-giving message and mission we have been given by the Lord. Folks, the race is on and the stakes, they are high. Two Sundays ago, a period of transition at First Baptist Church began a new phase. We began... We've known Brother Doug was leaving since a long, long time ago. He officially retired at the first of the year. And man, what a great man of God he is and what a great lady Miss Debbie is. And the church has been through a nine-month interim with the wonderful servants of David and Paulette. But two weeks ago, you began with uh, Randy and Debbie as your spiritual leaders. It's a pilgrimage together as pastor and people. And as we transition together into the bright and the beautiful future that God has for us, we recognize the many successes that he's already given First Baptist Church over her history. And I know it's your prayer as it is my prayer that those successes continue to be experienced by this great congregation of people in this great location with souls to reach that need the good news of Jesus Christ. So today I want us to visit this subject. If you look on the screen, you'll see the title, God's Secret for Success at First Baptist Church. And turning to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 4, if you would open up your copy of Scripture to those verses, Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. And if you are physically able to stand to honor the reading of the Word of God, if you would stand, please, we'll read those verses together and then pray. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Would you pray with me? Father, would you add to the reading of your word your blessing? 
And would you help the hurting hearts today, those who are recovering from surgeries and illness, and those, Lord, who have experienced death, expected or unexpected, in their homes and families. Lord, wrap your arms of love around them and just love on them with a gentle hug that only you can do. Lord, bless everyone as we seek to find your purpose and mission for our lives. Help us to understand the mission that you have given the church and help us to be willing individually, Lord, to make the commitment to do all that we can do in the power of Jesus Christ so that we can see souls come to know Jesus, so that we can see hurting hearts healed, and so that we can see our great nation turn back to you. Father, we pray for all the great volunteers here at First Baptist. We pray for all those who are giving and praying and working. And Lord, we pray that God, you would just bless our wonderful children and our wonderful youth and student ministry. God, that you'd bless our staff and help us, Lord, just to all work together for the good and the glory of God. Lord, speak to us in the message today and let your will be done in the service and we'll give you the praise for it's in Jesus' name we ask, amen. And you may be seated. Quite often, people ask me questions. When I was a young minister, I had all the answers. The older I get, the fewer answers I have. But I have a few along. But I still know people that seem to have all the answers, and some people know the right answers. Sometimes we all know the right answer to the question, but many of us don't live out the answer to that question in our own life or in the life of the church, we just know the right answer. You know, many people would be quick to say that the church is successful if, if the church meets my needs, if the church meets the needs of my family, then that church is a great church. They'll constantly, though, be on the lookout for a church that will meet the meet needs of their family better. There's doubtless also people that would say, well, I'm just clueless about what makes a good church. What makes a successful church is beyond me. I don't know. I just come to church when nothing else is more important, and, and then I just go back home, and I just leave that to somebody else. I just let the leaders take care of that. Well, if that's really the attitude of some of the folks that come to church, and some of the leaders of the church and some of the staff members of the church, if, if that could possibly be any of our attitudes, let me ask this question. Is it any wonder that we have conflict and stagnation in many churches in our land today? Is it any wonder that many churches epitomize anything other than success? Research shows that most churches in America today are plateaued or declining. That means they're just holding their own or they're going down in number and influence. But you know, here's a great truth. Nothing precedes purpose. We must have purpose. And so Jesus has enlisted and, and thinking about the starting point for every church is, to be, is a question that be answered, why are we here? Why does God have... First Baptist Church here in Oneida, Tennessee, in the midst of this beautiful creation. I tell you, you can't go anywhere and find a prettier natural setting than we're located in here. But why does God have this church located here in this position and in, in this place? Why are we here? Because until a church knows what the church is supposed to be accomplishing, it'll have no foundation it would have no motivation and have no direction. Well, the early church knew its function. It knew its purpose. And Jesus had enlisted these early followers not to a life of leisure, but to a life of serving him. Each one of them had a different task, but guess what? They all had the same calling. And the same calling was to fulfill the great commission in their generation. 
Have you ever thought about that? A lot of the people talk about the good old days in the church. Well, back in the 50s and the 60s or the 70s, you know, but let me tell you something. God has placed us in the middle of an exciting time to be a part of He's given us the opportunity and the challenge and the motivation to reach our world in our generation. The early church had one leader, and today's church can have only one leader, and that leader was Jesus Christ. And he is the only leader that First Baptist Church can have today. He has to be the leader, the head of the church today. Jesus, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And they had one purpose, and their purpose was to communicate the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to all the people of the world. So those early disciples, listen to what they did. They accomplished more for the spread of uh, Christianity than any generation since. So that leads us to the question, well, what was God's secret for success for the early church? That first century church, that church in embryo, as it were. What was God's secret for their success? And that brings us to the question, if you'll look on the screen, that we want to try to answer today. What is God's secret for success at First Baptist Church? And we could say in 2016 and beyond. Well, first of all, let's look at the first secret. Here we go. Look on this slide. First Baptist members must be unified in their purpose. The first thing we learn about uh, tug of rope, you ever, tug, you ever have a tug of war with a rope? You ever try that as a kid or as an adult? Well, I tell you what, if you get everybody pulling in the same direction, it's not any problem, is it? But if you've got two teams on opposing sides at each end of that rope, and you're pulling both directions, and it, boy, it gets pretty hard to pull sometimes, doesn't it? And God has said to the church of the first century, and he's saying it to the church of the 21st century, that we've got to be unified in our purpose. Let's look again at that 32nd verse, at the highlighted words there. All the believers were, would you read it with me? One in heart and mind. One in heart and mind. And so they had the same heart. They, their minds were set on the same thing. Yes, the early church was unified in their purpose, and all the believers shared in this unity, not just the leaders. <coughs> Excuse me. All the believers were unified, and there was a fundamental solidarity of love and purpose. They were family, and they had entered into a relationship with each other just like we have here at First Baptist Church. They shared the same spiritual father, God, and they shared a spiritual birth. They were all born into the family of God. The early church had entered into a fellowship with each other. They shared their lives and their possessions with one another, and it went beyond a kind word and a pat on the back and say, well, I, I hope everything's okay. I'm sure everything will be okay. We wish you well. They went further than that. They gave priority to meeting the physical and practical needs that were evident in the community. And the early church had not only entered into a fellowship with each other, but they entered into a partnership with each other. They didn't assemble merely for family gatherings or country club meals or making sure their physical needs were met, but these men and women were partners in reaching the world for Christ. They were on mission together. They linked arms not just for their own convenience and their own comfort and their own support, but to reach out to those that had not yet linked up or connected with them. For you see, the members of a church are a group of people from various backgrounds with different interests and different perspectives who have been called together for a purpose. The purpose is to cooperate together in reaching out beyond the walls of the church into their community, into their nation, and into their world so that that world can know the love of Jesus Christ. I can't think of one problem in the world today, not even one, that the love of Jesus Christ would not solve. It would solve every problem there is in the world today. And we wouldn't be listening to some of the things 
being passed off as business as usual today, if we could just get the love of Jesus Christ to our nation and to our world, that would solve all of our problems. That, you know, the purpose is cooperate together, reach beyond the walls, reach our community, reach our nation, and reach the ends of the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ because the church is in the life-saving business. And that endeavor is accomplished best when members understand that they are a family of friends in partnership with each other. We're in partnership with each other. So First Baptist members must be unified in their purpose. And then we can be unified all day long, but unless we've got this second secret down, we, we won't do a whole lot of good. Look at with, with me at the screen at the next slide there. First Baptist must work in the power of God. And boy, I'll just confess to you, one of my, one of my failures, Brother Steve, is trying to do things in my own power. And I don't know about any of you guys, but I, I, I struggle with that. And I know better, but I still struggle with it. And I see churches struggle with it, that we've got gifts and talents and abilities, and we just plan and program, and, and we're going to do it in our own power, but it just don't work that way. We can have a pretty good club that way, but we cannot have the church that way. First Baptist must work in the power of God. Look at verse 33 and say those first wor three words with me. Read them with me. With great power. With great power. Not their power. But with God's great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. Purpose is the power in life. And without purpose, there is motion without emotion. There is activity without accomplishment. There is efficiency without effectiveness. And the early disciples were focused in on their purpose and the corresponding result was the power of God as they accomplished what he asked them to do. And you know what? The, the power was evidenced by the church's growth. Somebody says, well, preachers are all time counting numbers. You better believe we're counting numbers. You know why? Because that's saying we're accomplishing the mission God has for us. Scholars estimate that the Jerusalem church, the early church there, the first church in embryo grew from 120 people to over 100,000 people in less than 25 years. I think God's in the numbers, don't you? I think Jesus died on the cross for numbers. I think Jesus died for the number one. Every one that was ever born, Jesus died so that they could be saved by his grace. And as the early church grew in 25 years, so exponentially, only God's power can do that. You know, my goal is not for my name or your name but that God could be glorified. I, I hope five years from now that people in Tennessee and Kentucky are saying, we've never heard of anything like what's going on in Oneida, Tennessee. Because God is at work and souls are being saved and lives are being changed and meth houses are being destroyed and lives are being put back together and relationships restored and God is at work and people are going to heaven because of what God is doing through his church in Oneida, Tennessee. I hope they're saying that all over the place because heaven is real and hell is real and life is short and death is looming and people need the Lord. And we don't have time to get warmed up. We need to hit the ground running and we need to see what it is that God wants us to do as his people. The early church realized that th their diversity could either take them down or could be used for their strength and they chose the latter. The early church was able to withstand the assault of Satan through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way we can do our work, I want to tell you something, Satan is real. And he's at work today like he's never been at work before. And he will destroy the fellowship of you and your friends, you and your family. He'll destroy the fellowship of this church if we would allow him to do it. 
But Jesus said, greater is he that is within us than he that's in the world. Let's not give him more power than he's got. Satan doesn't have any power except that which we give him. And so the early church knew that they could, through the power of the Holy Spirit, withstand the assault of Satan. And you know what? Pentecost was a great day. Thousands were saved. But you know what followed Pentecost? Persecution. Church leaders were thrown into prison. There was moral corruption everywhere. And there was a subtle ploy to distract the apostles from praying and from preaching the word by preoccupying them with ministry needs, which was not their calling. That wasn't their calling. It was to pray and to preach. And in each case, the church withstood the, the attack and stayed true to its purpose of reaching people for Jesus Christ. Everybody in the early church was not alike. Look around just a minute, everybody here. Now, now do it. Humor me just a minute. I'm new, okay. Look, look around at the people. Now, now, some of them you wouldn't mind being just like them, right? But now, there's, there's some of us. What if you had to be just like me? You'd go into deep, dark depression and excessive misery. Aren't you glad that God made us different? Aren't you got, glad that God has, has diversified our gifts, our talents, and our abilities? Not just our looks and not just the, the things that we like in life. Some people like Kentucky and some people like Florida and some people like Tennessee. I'm talking about sports teams now. And, you know, that's fine with me. I say everybody's going to get saved someday, you know, and they'll see the light then. Amen? Are you following me? But aren't you glad God made us different? Because that is his plan, is to take our diversity and turn us into his church that can reach a diverse world that's all around us. They had a different opinions. They had a wide assortment of gifts. But they found ways to integrate their differences by their unity in Christ so as to fulfill the purpose of God. And then finally this morning... Let's look at the last secret. First Baptist Church will discover the favor of God. When we do those two things, whenever we get unified in our purpose, and when we work in the power of the Holy Spirit, guess what's going to happen? We'll discover the favor of God. Look again at verse number 33, but let's focus on the last part. And would you read those verses with me? And much grace was upon them all. Aren't you glad for God's grace? Because the early disciples were unified in purpose and because they were committed to the task of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, much grace was upon them all. And grace, as you know, it means unmerited favor. It means we couldn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. It's God's love that's bestowed upon us. And because they were generous in the early church, God was generous to them. And because their heart broke over the same things that broke the heart of God, God smiled upon them. Because they held in high esteem the things that was the purpose of Jesus, God held the church in high esteem. So in summary, God's purpose and God's secret for success for the early church was being unified in their purpose, working in the power of God, and as a result, the early church discovered the favor of God. So, if the early church, if the God-given purpose of the early church was spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't you think that's probably the same purpose God has for First Baptist Church today? It seems to me that their success when individuals and as a church, that there exists this direct correlation between our faithfulness to God's purpose and God's favor in our lives. So we've answered that question. God's secret is unified in the purpose of God, working in the power of God, then we discover the favor of God. In a 2014 survey from Nashville-based LifeWay Research. It revealed an upbeat attitude that people have toward church going. Can you believe that? An upbeat attitude toward church going in America today. 
Two-thirds of Americans think attendance at church is admirable. And nearly nine in ten say, well, it's acceptable. If they want to do that, that's fine. And only 11% of Americans at large consider church useless. And even non-religious, they, they, they broke it down further. And people that were non-religious, non-church going and all, non-religious people have favorable opinions. 80% believe church attendance is acceptable even among non-religious people. And 43% label it admirable. And only 29% of non-religious people call going to church useless. Yet more Americans, follow me now, yet more Americans believe the church is dying than believe the church is thriving. Americans have a much more optimistic view of the people and practice of attending church than they do of the health of the church, said Scott McConnell, who's the executive director of LifeWay Research. He says church attendance is much like regular exercise and driving the speed limit. People do not live out everything they believe and admire. We believe a speed limit's good, don't we, until we're in a hurry. And we believe exercise would be good for us, don't we? But we don't exercise much, do we? Not as much as we should. So let me, what's the point for us, Pastor? Well, as the church moves into this new and different future, full of uncertainties to be sure, it must be unified around the certainty of her mission to take the message of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world beginning in our hood here, our neighborhood, and to all the neighborhoods around the world. That's the mission and purpose of the church. And we've got to be committed to that because people are lost and they're dying without Christ. And my beloved friends, our new church home and family, that involves not just having an optimistic view of the church, but it involves living out the teachings of Jesus Christ in our individual lives and in the corporate life of the church as Christ followers. We don't need to make any decisions as a church that is not weighed against the teachings of this book. And we don't need to make any decisions as an individual and as a family that's not measured against the teachings of this book. We need to be consistent. We need to be loving. We need to be kind. We need to be compassionate. And we need to be servant-spirited that we're willing to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to reach our neighbors and our neighbors around the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today and we thank you for the day that you have given us. We thank you for the message that we have heard through song. And we thank you for the preaching of the word that you have sent to us. And the challenge that, Lord, we must be together, unified, and we must be working in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you will bless us like you've never blessed us before. We know the church has done both of these things in the past. They have been unified, and Lord, they have worked in your power. So they know this message I'm preaching is the truth. Help us to understand that, Lord, the purpose is the same. The mission is the same. The criteria is the same. The power is the same. We must have your help. We must have your power. We must have the undergirding and assuring power of the Holy Spirit as we reach out to touch the world with good news that they certainly are longing to hear. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, while Robbie comes to lead us in our hymn of invitation?